You know, Pastor Paul was talking about gifts, and uh, because it's a season of giving, Lord, the Lord has given us a great gift in His Word. And, um, you know, especially in these times that we're living in right now, it just seems like so much is going on that just doesn't make any sense in this world. It's just crazy, uh, a lot of the things that are going on. And so about a year, at least a year ago, maybe longer, um, I felt the Lord just kind of laying a, a burden on my heart, a real concern for the body of Christ, that there needs to be a greater intimacy on the part of believers with the Word of God. So let's pray. Father God, I just thank you for the precious gift of your word. Your word was sent into this world to be a mighty blessing to us, more precious than silver, more costly than gold. And Lord, I just pray that this morning we'll catch a glimpse of, of our need, each one of us, myself included, our need to grow in a greater intimacy with your precious word. Lord, let each of us leave from this place different than when we came in. Have your way, Holy Spirit, in our hearts that we would receive your word today and not be forgetful hearers, but doers of the word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You know, that word intimacy, it really means closeness, to be very familiar with or to know something or someone very well. But unfortunately, it seems to be something that's lacking in the lives of many who profess to be believers when it comes to the Word of God. It's not just knowing a book. It's knowing the author and the spirit behind that book. Pastor Robert Morris, I don't know if you're familiar with him, he is senior pastor of Gateway Church down in Texas. He said that God invites us or he gives us permission to have in to me, capital M, C intimacy to have in to him into me see and we can have that through his word this past month as uh, pastor or apostle mentioned um, I taught the Bible college class on the importance and relevance of the word of God and don't worry I'm not going to give you all 12 hours, <laughs> give you the condensed version, you know, and just some, some of the key um, points that are important in, in uh, getting into the Word and understanding um, how intimate we can be with the Word of God. In the class, I shared some surprising statistics. I always like to check, you know, where we're at in this country especially. And... Uh, I'm only going to give you a few, but it indicated um, in one of the Barna uh, surveys that last year only 11% of adults in America read the Bible daily, and 29% never read it at all. The other 60% is kind of spread out in between there. They may read it once or twice a week, once or twice a month, once or twice a year, but not much. Seven out of ten Americans consider themselves to be Christians, yet only six of them, uh, only six percent, possess a biblical worldview. I found that kind of disturbing. Even though 87 percent of the households have a Bible. So it's not for a lack of availability to the Word. They could be reading the Bible if they chose to, 
But in the past 25 years, the number of American adults who have a biblical worldview in this country has declined by half. And if we look around, I think we can see the effects of that. Ever since the 60s when uh, the Bible and prayer were taken out of our public schools, it's been on decline ever since. So we can draw the conclusion from these statistics that the majority of those who profess to be Christians don't have a biblical worldview because they're not reading the word, or at least not very often, and or they're not being taught the word of God. So they're essentially biblically illiterate. Now that's not a problem in this church. <laughs> we are a word church, so we believe in, in preaching the word. But those who aren't getting fed the word, or they're not partaking of the word on their own, they're developing their worldview from a different source. From, uh, you know, on a, uh, issues like abortion, or racial issues, human rights, marriage, how to raise your kids, even gender. I, I never would have thought <laughs> that there'd be any issue with regards to gender. But they're getting their ideas on these issues from things like the secular news, from Hollywood, from social media, from our secular educational institutions, many of which were founded to be seminaries, Bible colleges, and now look at them. Or they're getting their ideas from the opinions of friends and family members instead of from the Word of God. And that's why it's so important for you and I to be in the Word, not just on Sunday mornings. I'm glad you're here, and that's good, but it's not enough. We need to be in the Word on a regular basis, preferably daily. Now, E.W. Kenyon said that our attitude toward the Word determines the place that God holds in our daily life. That's telling. In other words, if we don't consider God's Word important enough to be spending time in it on a regular basis, then perhaps we're not really putting God in the prominent place that he deserves in our life. Amen. Amen? The Bible isn't some antiquated book that isn't relevant for our lives today. In fact, it addresses every spiritual, social, moral issue that we, ever, we face in life or answers pretty much any question that we might have, but for far too many, it ends up being unopened on a coffee table or collecting dust on a shelf somewhere. You know, God values his word, he, so much so that he magnifies it above all his name. And that word magnifies, you know, we have our magnifying glasses at home, we wear them on our faces, but that word magnifies means to extol or show respect for, to hold in high esteem, to make great. That's how God views his word, and so should we. In Psalm 119, verse 162, the psalmist expressed the value he placed on the word when he said, I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure. Is that how we view the word of God? You know, I think any, any one of us, if we went in our backyards to, to dig a hole, whether it's for a swimming pool or for a garden or flower bed or something, and we heard a clank with our shovel, and we kept digging, and, and up came a box of metal or wood, and we opened and found all this treasure, these jewels and gold. And wouldn't we get excited? I mean, we'd probably be jumping for joy, you know, counting it. That's how the psalmists view the word of God. 
like that treasure that is so precious that when he finds it, he rejoices. Jeremiah felt the same way. In Jeremiah 15, 16, he said, Your words were found, and I ate them. Wow. It was sustenance to him. And he says, And your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Now, Jeremiah, if you've read the book of Jeremiah, this guy went through a lot to be obedient and... and speak forth the word of God. And he was tempted to quit, to back away. But he said the word burned within him. He couldn't help but declare the word of God. He ate it. It became part of him. It, he took it into his very being. And he rejoiced over it because he knew it was the word of the Lord. Jesus himself describes his words as being spirit and life, and they really are. They're life-giving, life-sustaining, so much so that when the devil tempted him, you know, he, Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness, and so the devil naturally comes to tempt his flesh and say, okay, now turn these stones into bread. But what does Jesus do? Instead, he says, it is written. He goes to the word. It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Job. <laughs> We've all heard of the woes of Job. And yet he said, I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Can we say that? We treasure the word of God more than our necessary food. I don't know about you, but I like to eat. I like my two or three meals a day, occasional snack in between, a dessert now and then. I think we all do. And we know that we have to eat the physical food in order to, you know, keep our physical bodies healthy and, you know, sustain it. But Job understood something along with the psalmist and Jeremiah and Jesus himself. That we need more than that. We need the spiritual food. And that's going to last. That's going to sustain us a whole, lo whole lot longer than a you know, Big Mac. Mm -hmm. When you understand that the Word of God is not just a book, it's a person. It's the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. You'll begin to understand that when you spend time in the Word, you're spending time with Him. Many don't seem to appreciate the fact that Jesus and the Word of God are one and the same. But the Apostle John said in John chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then down in verse 14, he adds, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Emmanuel, God with us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Two wonderful words. Jesus came full of grace. His unearned, unmerited, undeserved favor, which he offers freely, without hesitation to anyone, who will receive it by faith. And he also came full of truth. Unfortunately, have you noticed how many people have problems understanding uh, what truth is? They're confused about truth. They think, well, you can have your truth and I can have my truth. That there is no absolute truth. Well, 
That's not true. <laughs> Truth is what is real, what is actual, what is exact. Truth is a fixed or established principle. And I love this one. It's the original norm. The original norm. Not the latest fad in society, not being woke, but waking up to the fact that there is an absolute truth, an original norm, it originated with God Almighty. He set the standard. He decided this is truth. And we can know the truth. Jesus is not only full of truth, but he said in John 14, 6, I am the truth. Amen. The truth, definite article, not a truth, not one among many. He is the truth. And how do we come to know that truth? Well, for those of us that are born again, we've received Jesus as our personal Savior and Lord. We've come to know the truth. We were introduced to the truth. But it doesn't stop there. Now we be, need to begin to grow in the truth. Yeah. Get to know the one who is truth more and more intimately. And he'll speak to you and I through his words, which were written down as the Holy Spirit moved upon those who were to write them. The Holy Spirit who is a spirit of truth, will guide you into all truth. You're not left on your own. You were given another helper who will help you understand what the Bible is saying. He wants you to not just, you know, gloss over it and get a vague idea of what it's saying. He wants you to know intimately the Word of God. And so he'll help you if you ask. Paul told Timothy, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That literally means God breathed. I love that. In the Greek, it's theonutos. Theo meaning God, and nutos means breathed. And the root word nu, that's P-N-E-U, describes three things. And I just, I love this. I think this is so cool. New describes creative power. As in Genesis 1-1, when the breath of God was released as he spoke the universe into being. And he created order out of chaos and light out of darkness. New also describes the sounds of music. No, not the musical. <laughs> okay, I love that, but you know, uh, not, not that one, but it's the sound that's made like when somebody's blowing on a wind instrument, like a flute or a piccolo. And then thirdly, new describes a perfume or fragrance. So we could say that the word being God-breathed can bring order out of chaos and light, out of the darkness of some situation that you're dealing with, some circumstance that you're in the middle of in your life or in your home. It can change the sound, the musical sound or the noise <laughs> of your life or home from discord to harmony. And if released, it can change the smell or fragrance of your life and or home from something that stinks. Have you ever said, this just stinks? <laughs> it's putrid. But the word of God can change that into something that's wonderfully aromatic. It can bring the music and the fragrance of heaven to earth. That's what the Lord wants his word to bring into our lives. Order out of chaos, light out of darkness. Melodious music, 
instead of noise. A beautiful fragrance rather than a putrid stink. The word declares God's love for us and the goodness that he wants to bring into our lives from Genesis to Revelation. And it's his primary, not soul, but primary method of communicating with us. Today, under the new covenant, God speaks to us by his son. And I love what the Song of Solomon says uh, in uh, chapter 1, verse 2, where it's the Shulamite saying, let him, and she's referring to her beloved, and the Shulamite is often um, uh, spoken of as being a representative of the church. And her beloved, which was King Solomon, is representative of our Lord, our beloved, our heavenly bridegroom. And she says, let him kiss me with his mouth. That's his word. And then she realizes that her beloved has arrived on the scene and has heard what she said. And so then she turns to him and adds, for your love is better than wine. It's intoxicating. The love that we can receive from him is intoxicating. It can become, we can become so intimate with God's word that it's like being kissed by him. Jesus waits for us to just open the door of our hearts and to let him in to have fellowship. Let him speak to us from his word, to reveal himself to us through his word. <clears throat> On Resurrection Day, two of Jesus' disciples, not any from the original 12 or at this point the original 11, Two of them were heading home on the road to Emmaus, and they were talking about the recent events of, of the day. And uh, suddenly there was somebody walking behind him. It was Jesus. And he caught up with them and started walking alongside him. And it says that, but their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. They didn't recognize the Lord. And so Jesus asked them, well, what are you talking about? How come you're so sad? And they responded. They were kind of surprised that, you know, this was the big talk of the town. You know, why don't you know what's been going on? And so they uh, explained to him that this one that they had been following, that they hoped was going to redeem Israel, ended up being crucified and buried. And as some women... You know, so they went to the tube and found it empty, but they didn't see him. And then in Luke 24, verses 25 to 27, and this is in the New Living Translation, it says, Then Jesus said to them, You foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory. Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. I know I often wondered, and apparently um, Pastor Joseph Prince, I don't know if you're familiar with him, he's senior pastor of New Creation Church in Singapore, was also puzzled as to why Jesus would restrain their eyes. Why wouldn't he want them to know that it was him, you know, walking and talking with him? And so Pastor Prince, he asked the Lord, you know, why'd you do that? And, and Jesus responded to him and said, because it was more important that they see me in the scriptures than in person. 
And I thought about that. And, you know, it dawned on me that we may not all be blessed with a personal visitation from Jesus. I know some have. And that's wonderful. And I would love that. But we don't all get that. But we can see him in the word every day. Every day we can get into the word and we can see Jesus. Whether it's, you know, the the obvious things from the New Testament or the types and shadows in the Old. No matter where we're at within the 66 books of the Bible, we can see Jesus. They are meant to point to him. And then the disciples and Jesus shared communion together. And that was when the eyes of their, you know, their eyes were open and Jesus vanished. And then in verse 32 it says, They said to each other, Didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? He can talk to us through the pages of his word and explain by the Holy Spirit what it is that we're reading. In his high priestly prayer, Jesus um, said that this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. It's knowing him. Knowing him, not about him, but knowing him. Not just having an intellectual knowledge, but a personal heart knowledge that comes from the workings of the Holy Spirit within you, causing the word to come alive within you. That rhema word, that quickened word within you that helps to form that intimate relationship between you And the word of God, that is eternal life. The word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. That phrase, two-edged sword, means two-mouthed. That means the word is first in God's mouth and then it's in our mouth. The word is powerful, but that power has to be, you know, released. It lies dormant like seed that's left in the package until it is spoken out loud. That's why it has to be heard through the preaching of the word or through us speaking it out loud as as we are reading it or as the Holy Spirit brings a scripture back to our remembrance in a situation that we're in, and we come into agreement then with what God has said. How can two walk together unless they be agreed? How can we walk with God unless we are in agreement with his word? And how can you do that unless you, don't, unless you know what the word says? Right. You've got to be in the word. It's got to be in here so that it can come out here and be expressed And be able to change your life and your circumstances. The word is not going to return void. And it will accomplish what God has sent it out to do when it's spoken out. The word will renew our minds and transform our lives as we get it in our hearts and in our mouths. You know, Mary, the the sister of Martha and Lazarus. At first glance, you might think that Mary was kind of inconsiderate, not helping out her big sister with, with uh, preparing the meal and, and serving it to Jesus. Martha being the older sister, and she owned the home. Um, you know, she was very busy, wanting to be the good hostess. But Mary just sat at Jesus' feet, listening. To the word. So when Martha complained about the neglect of her sister, Jesus said, Oh, no, no. Mary has chosen the one thing that's needful, and it will not be taken away from her. 
I believe Mary knew, like Peter, that Jesus has the words of eternal life. Yeah. And, and deep down, I think she realized, if I, if I listen to what he has to say, it's going to change the way I think. It's going to change my life. And she saw how valuable that was. And it can do the same for us. When the incorruptible seed of the word of God's planted in the good soil of a heart that's gladly received it with understanding and has retained it, is committed to it, has kept out any rocks of offense that might want to come as a result of persecution, and has not allowed the thorns that can be created in it by the distractions of this world that would come to choke out the word. A heart that's taken the word and mixed it with faith, that is a heart that can develop deep roots in the word of God and with time bear much good fruit. But if we don't allow the word to become deeply rooted in our hearts, in our lives, so that we really know the truth, not with a um, mental assent, but really know it, revelation knowledge of the word. If we don't possess that, we'll fall for the lie. You can't counter a lie if you don't know the truth. Pastor Rob McCoy said, The truth is never afraid of a lie. Amen. But a lie cannot survive in the presence of truth. So it's kind of important to know the truth. Amen? Yeah, Jesus said in John 8, verse 31 and 32, that if we abide... In his, in his word, and that word abide means to dwell. You camp there. I don't know if you've ever gone camping, but when you set up a tent, you've got to put the stakes down so that tent isn't going to go anywhere. And so to abide in the word means to dwell, to continue in it. Not be passive, not hit and miss, but continue in the word, remain there and stand in the word. And Jesus says, if you do that, then you're his disciples indeed. And you'll know the truth. And the truth that you know, not the truth by itself, but the truth that you know, that you know, that you know, <laughs> is the truth that will set you free. An example of this is the fact that Jesus, he knew and knows the word so intimately that when the devil tempted him in the wilderness, and the devil will always do this with you as well as with Jesus, he'll take a little bit of truth and he'll twist it. He'll pervert it and, and misapply it, add to it or take away from it. But because Jesus knew the word so well, he recognized when the devil was twisting it, and he was able to resist and counter the temptation with it is written every time. And that's what we need to be able to do as well. That's how we submit to God and resist the devil. We submit to the truth of the word of God. And by doing that and applying it to our situation, then we're resisting the devil and his lies. And he's got to take a hike. God said his people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And I was, I was curious about that word destroyed because, you know, sometimes we think we understand the meaning of a word, but then if you look it up in the original, in this case Hebrew, um, we find there's more to it than we thought. And that word destroyed means to fail, perish, cease, 
be cut down, be undone, be brought to silence. When I saw that last one, immediately I, I thought of how many times, I know this has happened in my life, how many times have we been confronted by a lie, whether it's the devil planting it in our thoughts or speaking it through somebody, you know, directly to us, and we don't know the word well enough to respond. We can't counter that lie. We might know deep down, oh, that doesn't sound quite right, but you don't know for sure, and you certainly don't know how to counter it, and so you're brought to silence. And there's, there goes the witness to that person. And you're left going, well, I don't know. I don't know if that's, if that's right or not. And, and that's not a good place to be. It's not good to be brought to that place of silence that you can't make a defense for the faith. We're supposed to be answer, answer those who ask us about the hope that is within us. We need to be able to explain it to them, tell them why. But when we don't know the word of God, we won't know the promises that are ours, what our inheritance is. We won't know who we are in Christ. We won't understand the, the width, length, depth, and height of God's love for us. If we don't know that, we're not going to have the confidence the, the steadfastness, the stability in our lives that we need when it comes to dealing with the, the bombardment of what's going on out there in the culture. If we don't understand these things, then we can easily fall prey to the deceptions of the devil. And over and over, God warns us in his word to guard against being deceived. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, verse 1, that the Spirit expressly says, that means in stated terms, he wanted to make it clear that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. How does that happen? Except when someone who says they're a believer doesn't know the word of God. And something can sound good. It may sound like it might have come from God's word. But it's deception. I know years ago when uh, that replacement theology started circulating. And if you didn't know what the word said, you could buy into that. God's replaced Israel, the chosen people, with the church. But that's not what the Word says. If you know what the Word says, you understand that God's not done with Israel. He didn't create them, make them into a nation in a day, like was prophesied, to just give up on them. There's coming a day when he says all Israel will be saved. We're to continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. He's not done. In fact, his plan is that Jesus would be the peace between the Jews and the Gentiles, and we would become one new man in Jesus Christ. He's not done with Israel. But if you don't know what the word says, you could buy into that. So when you're not grounded, you're not intimate in the word, you can get careless. You can get neglectful. Or you can develop itching ears that wants to hear the latest, newest teaching. Because after all, haven't you heard it all? And if you've heard it, you must know it, right? Mm, not necessarily. Those are the kind of people who don't discern what spirit is behind the source of that teaching. We're told to discern the spirits. If someone comes along with a new teaching, but they don't 
uh, declare or confess that Jesus came in the flesh, that's the spirit of Antichrist. You pitch that Amen. out the door. You don't pay attention to that. Don't be deceived. So how do we get intimate with the word? It's really rather simple. Hear it. Read it. Study it. Get yourself a good Strong's Concordance. Get Vine's Expository Dictionary of Old Testament and New Testament words. Get a Spirit-filled commentary. And study the Word of God. Meditate on it. Meditate. Uh, there's a couple places. Joshua, Psalm 1, where it says, When they meditate on the Word of God day and night, you'll make your way successful. Whatever you put your hands to do will prosper. When you meditate on the word, you ponder it. You mutter it under your breath over and over and over again, repeating it, M mulling over it like Mary pondered all the things that were taking place that didn't necessarily make sense at the time, but she kept them in her heart, pondering them again and again and again till it really sinks in and becomes that revelation knowledge that you have need of so that you get to the place of really believing it and then acting on it not being a forgetful hearer but a doer of the word and it reminds me of you know when Jesus got to uh, the end of his sermon on the mount and he was comparing those who heard his sayings and did them to a person who builds his house on a rock and the winds blow and the rains fall and beat against that house and it stands because it's built on the rock of the word of God but then he also compared those who hear the word but they don't act on it they're those forgetful hearers and they're like the person who builds his house on the sand and those same winds come and beat against that house and the rains pour down and beat on that house and great is the fall of it because they didn't value the word enough to build their life on it the house that Jesus was referring to is your life. And you want to build it on a rock, Amen. a solid foundation, a sure foundation, as Peter referred to it, of the Word of God. All Scripture, 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture, not parts of, some people like to pick and choose. But Paul said, no, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine or teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness or training in right living. You know, that must have been pretty important to the Apostle Paul. I was curious about this, so I checked it out. And five times in Paul's writings to believers, he said, I would not have you ignorant or unaware brethren and then he'd go on to you know explain what he didn't want them to be ignorant about there were things that he he knew they needed to know and we have those things in in our New Testament the teachings of Paul we don't want to be ignorant God doesn't want us to be ignorant because the word of God is profitable to us for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So as you read the word of God, ask the Holy Spirit to show you what he wants you to learn from the passage that you're, you're reading. Study those key words and phrases in the original Hebrew or Greek. And you say, well, I'm not, you know... I'm not in Bible college. <laughs> I wasn't always either. But our English language is really limited in its ability to give us 
a full understanding of what God intended to communicate to us. The Hebrew and Greek is so much richer uh, and just full of meaning that our very basic <laughs> words in the English language just do not convey. So study some of those, or those key words out and let the word of God correct you. <laughs> I know people don't like, you know, starting when we're kids. We don't like to be corrected. It can be kind of painful to be corrected. But you know, God's a loving Heavenly Father, and He corrects those whom He loves. Just like you. If you're a loving parent, you don't let your kids get away with everything. They need to be corrected. They need to be set on the right course to benefit their lives. And God is, is far greater parent than any of us. Proverbs 15 verse 5 says, A fool despises his father's instruction, but he who receives, accepts correction is prudent or wise. In the Greek, the word for correction is a term that's used to describe someone who's been knocked flat by life. So correction means to take that person who's been knocked flat and pick him back up and set him on his feet again. Which means that if we believe the word of God and we act upon it, we apply it to our lives, it has the power to pick us back up when we've been laid flat and set us back on our feet again no matter what's happened in life, no matter how messed up things have gotten, God in his loving grace has the desire to pick us back up and set us back on our feet again so that we can move forward. There's an old um, chorus that we learned back in the uh, Charismatic Renewal um, back then, I loved it so much because most of our songs, our little choruses, were scripture verses. And it was a great way to memorize scripture without putting a whole lot of effort into it. And there was one from Proverbs called, The Steps of a Good Man. And it goes, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, though he fall, he shall not be cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand, with his hand, with his hand, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. Though he fall, though he fall, he shall not be cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. <laughs> That's our loving Heavenly Father. He doesn't want us leave doesn't want to leave us laid flat. <laughs> doesn't matter if, if the mess we're in is our of our own making or not. He wants to pick us back up. If we'll let the word correct us, it'll pick us back up and set us on our feet again. 2 Timothy 3.17 tells us the purpose of getting intimate with the Word and why it's important for us to learn the truth and apply it in our lives when it says that the man or woman of God may be complete, which means mature, thoroughly equipped for every good work, not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, but well established in the word. Mature, not still wet behind the ears. And thoroughly equipped, or the King James says furnished, for, excuse me, every good work. Rick Renner, who's a, a teacher of the word, and he's very well versed in the Greek, he indicated that the old Greek word for the phrase thoroughly equipped or furnished for every good work was used in only one way. In the ancient world, there were boats on the Sea of Galilee. 
but they were all of the same simple, basic design. Apparently, there was only one builder <laughs> of the boats that were on the Sea of Galilee. He must have had a monopoly or something. And, and these basic boats, they couldn't go very far. They always tended to drift back to shore because they had no oars or sail. They were just a basic design. They weren't designed for long-term or long-range sailing. And they couldn't withstand rough weather. But that same simple boat could be equipped. It had the potential to be equipped, thoroughly furnished with everything that was needed to go the distance and to survive the rough weather, the storms of life that would come against it. Paul was saying then, basically, that there are two kinds of Christians. The unequipped and the thoroughly equipped. We're all boats. We all started out when we received Christ as that very basic, simple, designed boat. But we have the potential to become thoroughly equipped. by becoming intimate with the Word of God. The choice is ours. And it's not, we need to keep this in mind, being thoroughly equipped isn't just for our own benefit, just so that we can go the long haul and withstand the storms of life, although that's very important. Because if we can't, we're not going to be much good to anybody else. So being thoroughly equipped is not just for ourselves. It is to benefit others. We're to be thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's what's needed in order to bless other people. To be strong in our faith so that when they're weak, we can hold them up. We can be a, a, a blessing and an encouragement to them. But the choice, again, is ours. I hope that this word has encouraged you to, to value the word of God more than you ever have before. To see how precious it is to have that intimacy with the living word of God, the Lord Jesus, through the wit written word of God, the Bible, and to allow it to develop, you know, create a solid foundation under your life and thoroughly equip you for every good work. Let's pray. Oh, Father, I thank you for your word, this precious gift that you gave so that we could grow in intimacy with you. We could know how much you love us. We could know all that you desire to bless us with. And we could know how to be a blessing to others. Lord, I thank you. Your word's a lamp to our feet to know where we stand now and a light to our path so we know the direction you want us to take. Thank you, Lord, that you've spoken to every heart, that we leave here changed, and I pray determined to become more intimate with your word, with the help of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.